this is the first uh, lecture of the Expanding Empathy Lecture Series hosted by the Black Ethics Institute. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is a series of four speakers that are going to talk about topics related to empathy, ethics, and moral decision making. Uh, broadly construed, it's meant for a broad interdisciplinary audience, so uh, we hope you enjoy it. Uh, our distinguished first speaker is Jesse Graham. He's the George S. Eccles Chair of Business Ethics at the University of Utah. So he's been an associate professor of international um, Nailed it. Nailed it? Okay. Uh, he got his PhD with Jonathan Haidt. Won many awards over his career. He's won the Sage Young Scholars Award from the CSC, uh, the Association for Psychological Science and the Ethics Scholar Award. Uh, he's perhaps most well known in some ways for the moral foundations theory, uh, an approach to moral diversity and the social good of the whole. I've known Jesse for a long time. Actually, when I was a grad student, I went to a grad mentoring luncheon with him, and thought that he was a wonderful experience. published widely in a wide array of journals, some of the top journals in the field of social psychology, the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, the New Journal of Education, the Proceedings of Science and Cognitive Sciences. He's widely published, very distinguished. Uh, I'm honored to have him here. So, thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Daryl, for that uh, introduction, and um, thank you all for, for coming. Um, I'm going to start by just acknowledging the um, disembodied floating heads of my uh, collaborators on this project, uh, Adam Waits, Ravi Iyer, Leanne Young, and Pete Meindl. Uh, so the first part of this talk is, is based on a sort of uh, theoretical piece that we had come out a couple of years ago, starting to think about different forces in the moral circle, and I'll, I'll talk about what that is. Um, but this piece itself was actually sort of an outgrowth of some empirical work that we've been working on um, for several years. Um, and this is also in collaboration uh, with my advisor, John Haidt. And uh, this paper actually just came out uh, a few months ago in Nature Communications. Um, and so I'm putting a halo of acknowledgement here around Adam uh, because he was really the, the driving force behind uh, this project. Um, and so I'm giving him the credit because he's not here, also deflecting any blame directly onto him uh, as well. Um, so I want to start with uh, a main uh, applied point, which is to understand and work to reduce prejudice, we need to understand the moral forces that support it. And so I'm putting this in, in big, bold font right at the beginning. Uh, just to make it clear, I'm not going to be offering any kind of normative defense uh, of prejudice. Um, all the work I'm going to be talking about is, is purely descriptive. Um, but I do think if you, if you have the normative goal of, of trying to fight prejudice, um, that it's important to look at morality in, in a few different ways and see ways that our sort of moral nature might actually lead us toward prejudice and not just lead us uh, away from prejudice. Um, so the idea of the moral circle goes back centuries, um, but it was really popularized by this 1981 book by Peter Singer. Um, so the, the, in the metaphor, imagine yourself standing in the middle of a bunch of concentric circles representing increasingly distant social groups, right? So the first circle might be your immediate family, then your extended family, you know, the friends and people in your community, people in your nation, people in your part of the world. You can extend farther out to all humans, extend even farther to all mammals maybe all animals, all living things, right? And go all the way out to like space rocks. Space rocks is sort of the farthest away we can think of, things that are non-living, not on this earth, right? The, the farthest sort of entity you can imagine. Um, and Peter Singer used this idea, and he said the moral circle, wherever you draw it, that's basically the circle within which you care about right and wrong being done to those entities, right? So where is your moral circle? Who, who do you sort of morally, who are you morally concerned about? Who or what? And he used this metaphor to, to try to make the normative argument that we should always be trying to expand our moral circles, right? We should not only be concerned with people who look like us. We should be concerned with people on the other uh, side of the world. We should not only be concerned with humans. We should also uh, bring other animals into our moral circle as well. And so interestingly, anywhere you think about drawing the moral circle, you can think of that line drawing as a form of prejudice, right? You're saying there's some sort of moral preferencing for some over others, right? So if you just drew the moral circle around people of your race or people of your nation, we would all kind of recognize that as, as very prejudiced, as sort of nationalist or racist. Um, even if you drew it around all humans, you might think that's a kind of speciesist prejudice. Why do you care about only people of, uh, you know, entities of your species and not other animals? 
Um, even if you drew the circle very wide and include all living things, you could even think of that as some form of prejudice, right? I care about the living things, don't care about non-living things. And I think for a lot of us, there's just a sort of natural kind of prejudice aversion. It, it feels icky to draw the line anywhere because you're saying, I morally care about these, but not those, right? So there's a kind of othering there. This brings me to the idea of, of centripetal and centripetal forces in the moral circle. I think this kind of prejudice aversion is one of those forces that's kind of leading outward. So centrifugal means center fleeing. These are forces sort of compelling us to, to expand our moral circles outward. And centripetal means center seeking. And so these would be forces urging us to contract our moral circles or make some sort of preferences for those closer to us than those farther away. And so it's the, it's the opposition of these forces, both between people and within people, that I'm really interested in. And so some of the centripetal forces um, that we've written about are things like prejudice aversion, um, intuitions and feelings of equality and fairness. All of these are urging us to, to have as, as wide and expansive a moral circle as possible. Um, equality concerns, both intuitive and deliberative, utilitarian principles. Um, so when Peter Singer uh, writes about this, he really sees these centrifugal forces as, as exclusively deliberative. He really thinks it's, you know, we, we need to be unemotional, totally rational, and just think in terms of utilitarian principles, and that's how we can expand our circle. But the way we've written about these, I really think these are a mix of, of both intuitive and deliberative uh, forces in our sort of moral nature. Similarly, I think there's uh, intuitive and even deliberative um, forces urging in the opposite direction. Right? So even though most of us probably think we should have as wide a moral circle as we possibly can, if I told you that I care exactly as much about a stranger's child as I do for my own children, a lot of you would probably think there's something morally wrong with me. Right? So a lot of us share some kind of intuition that we have some duty to, to family that we don't have to others, that, that maybe we should be morally preferencing, maybe I should be more morally concerned with my kids than with uh, a total stranger. And so things like uh, family attachment, you know, ideas of loyalty to your family, loyalty to your group or your nation, um, and also sort of philosophical principles of, of duty to close others. All of these are kind of working in the opposite direction, either urging us to contract our circles, or if not to fully contract them, then to make some sort of hierarchy, right? So there should be some sort of preferencing for the close others over other people. So today I want to try to apply this idea of these opposing forces to two different areas, um, looking at prejudice and empathy, and then prejudice in politics. So I'll start with empathy. As I, I'm sure many of you here know, uh, recently empathy has come under attack. Uh, people like Paul Bloom, Jesse Prinz, and Peter Singer himself uh, have said that emotional empathy, so feeling the pain of others, is a really poor guide to moral action. Right. And one of the main reasons that it's a poor guide is because of its centripetal nature, right? Empathy is parochial. We're more likely to feel the pain of people who look like us. We're more likely to feel the pain of other humans than we are to feel the pain of, of other animals, unless they happen to be really cute, right? And so empathy is just, it's sort of biased. It's, it's prejudiced, it's parochial, it's enumerative. And so uh, people like Bloom and Singer say it's, it's just a really bad guide to moral action because it's centripetal. Now, for Bloom and Singer, they say this centripetal force of empathy needs to be counteracted with the centripetal force of basically rationalism, right? They say we should just be unemotional, be purely rational, uh, and be deliberative. We should use things like utilitarian principles, and that's how we can make more fair moral decisions. Um, Jesse Prinz makes a slightly different argument. He actually says that um, the, the centripetal force of empathy should be counteracted with uh, another emotional force, which he calls righteous rage. And he says righteous rage is actually a really important sort of fire starting up a lot of social justice movements, right? Righteous rage about, say, fairness or equality. But again, the, they're seeing empathy as, as a strictly centripetal force uh, that needs to be counteracted by something else. Uh, but luckily for, for empathy, some psychologists have, have come forward to defend empathy. First and foremost, uh, Penn State's own Daryl Cameron, um, who has argued that, uh, for, first, uh, Daryl has, has really effectively argued against this sort of pure emotion versus cognition sort of dichotomy that's, that's going on in some of these arguments. And he's also shown that empathy is a sort of motivational choice, right? It's something that we can choose to do. It's something that takes work. 
And, and if it's something that, that we choose to do, it's not just purely reflective, then maybe we can choose to expend empathy farther out. Similarly, Jamil Zaki uh, at Stanford has argued that empathy could maybe be a kind of affective fire in the engine. And yes, maybe it starts in those inner circles, right? Maybe empathy starts with the people closest to us, but then once we feel empathy for those who are close to us, maybe then it can sort of expand outward. So in both of these conceptualizations, I'm not sure if you agree, but I, I think that there's a sort of idea that empathy could also be a centripetal force itself. And this, interestingly, is, is um, uh, sort of Zaki's view is really how Edmund Burke talked about uh, the moral circle uh, 230 years ago. So he said, to be attached to the subdivision, to love the little platoon we belong to in society is the first principle, the germ, as it were, of public affections. It is the first link in the series by which we proceed towards love to our country and to mankind. Right? So you're starting what he, what, he, what he calls the kind of fellow feeling. Right? It starts between uh, parent and child, and then is, is attached to our, you know, our little platoon, our little subdivision, then to our nation, and then the world. So again, empathy is this sort of, you know, it's this kind of emotional affect of fire in the engine that could maybe start in the middle and then spread out. So I think a lot of these um, kind of philosophical debates about empathy come down to some uh, real empirical questions when you think about them in terms of these opposing forces. Uh, one of them is, uh, is moral regard zero sum? This is something that Paul Bloom argues. He says, look, you've only got a certain amount of money to donate to charity. You've only got 24 hours in the day. If you're spending more moral concern, more care uh, on people close to you, then you just have less to give to those farther out. Right? Whereas some of these other conceptualizations suggest that maybe empathy for close to others can be used to increase empathy overall. Another empirical question, must empathy be counteracted to fight prejudice, or can it actually be used to fight prejudice? Right? So here I'm thinking about things like uh, heart-tugging stories uh, about distant others that get you to really feel for people that you hadn't thought about or, or felt much for uh, in the past. You know, maybe empathy can be sort of used in the direction of, of social justice and not just prejudice. And here's the part of the talk where I should tell you all my empirical answers to the, these empirical questions. I have no answers to these questions. I leave it to Daryl and his lab to answer all of these. Um, but again, the, the point here is just that this is sort of a, a, a possibly helpful way of thinking about these empathy debates as these opposing forces in the moral circle. So let me move on uh, to politics, where I do have some empirical answers to some empirical questions. Um, there's a lot of different theories uh, in psychology and political science uh, of political ideology. Um, so Jost has looked at uh, ideology as sort of motivated social cognition. I'll talk a little later about my work uh, in moral foundations theory. Uh, Ronnie Jenna Bowman has a model of moral motives that's based on sort of approach versus avoidance. Um, John Hibbing and, and colleagues have a theory that political conservatism is really all about threat sensitivity. Um, so all the, and there's a lot of differences between these theories, but all of them sort of led us to the same basic kind of hypothesis, which is that liberals, uh, c compared to conservatives, will expend moral concern toward larger, farther, less structured and more encompassing social circles, whereas conservatives will expand moral concern towards smaller, closer, more well-defined, uh, and less encompassing social circles. So as an example of this, um, those of you yearning for a more genteel time in our, our national politics, we can go way back to 2012 during the Romney versus Obama um, election. Um, uh, Romney, my senator, Mitt Romney, um, was the Republican uh, nominee, and at the Republican National Convention, he said, President Obama promised to begin to slow the rise of the oceans and heal the planet. My promise is to help you and your family. And so he's really trying to set up a real contrast here. He's saying, forget that outer circle of the planet. I know what you really care about is you and your family, your inner circle. Right? So he's really trying to appeal to this idea of Obama's, he's out there uh, on the outer circles. I know you really care about those inner circles. Obama, after he won that election, he was speaking at a, a convocation, and he told students, I hope you choose to broaden and not contract your ambit of concern. Right? So he, here he's very explicitly telling students to widen their moral circles, expand your moral circles uh, as widely as you can. And I, these are the kinds of contrasts that I'm, I'm sure we will see play out in the 20th. So we wanted to look at this um, at a few different levels of the moral circle. So our prediction is that conservatives 
uh, relative to liberals, uh, will show preferential moral regard um, toward family versus friends, uh, toward the nation versus the world, and toward humans versus non-humans. I realize how old my references are with family time. <laughs> Um, really divided the room with that. Um, and so again, we want to look at this at sort of the inner circle level, but also uh, more outer circles. Um, and we had a, a bunch of studies. I'll, I'll just show you sort of a, a sampling of some of them. Um, the first one was a, a really basic one that we did where we just took Belinda Campos' love of humanity scale, um, which very conveniently had subscales for love for friends, such as my friends and I look out for each other, uh, items related to love for family, my siblings and I love each other warts and all, and then love for all others, right? So there are times in my life when I felt strong feelings of love for all people, not just the specific people that I'm close to. Um, and we're just interested in how these different sort of subscales varied by political ideology. So here on the x-axis is people's self-reported uh, political ideology. The extreme liberals over here, uh, moderates in the middle, and the extreme conservatives over here. Uh, we find, uh, you know, very, very sort of uh, slight effects, but they're all... Um, quite reliable because we had a lot of people. Um, we find a, a slight uh, effect here for friendship, but almost nothing really going on. Liberals very, very slightly um, expressing a little bit more love uh, for friends. But we see more clearly that conservatives are expressing more love for family. And the strongest effect here is liberals expressing more love for all others, right? For, for people they, they don't necessarily know, for, for all humanity. And now it's tempting with a graph like this to look at this and see Okay, so it seems like conservatives, you know, they like their friends and family more than, more than strangers, uh, but liberals really seem to like strangers and their friends more than people in their own family. It's, it's a little hard to compare the lines just because these are made of different items. Uh, and so in the next study, we actually used the exact same items just so we could make that kind of uh, comparison. And so here we used a different scale. This is the identification with all humanity scale. Um, and we modified it to have different targets for each question. Um, and so the questions were about, you know, how much you identify with, how much do you have moral concern for uh, different groups. And so people were answering each question in terms of people in my community, people in my country, and all humans everywhere. And so here again, we, we uh, predicted that conservatives would, would show more of this kind of moral concern for people in their country, whereas liberals would show more of a concern for all humans everywhere. For people in my community, we were sort of torn. Uh, you know, community is a kind of inner circle so we thought that conservatives might show a preference there. But the word community, I think, has been kind of politicized. So for instance, uh, a lot of Republican uh, you know, pundits made fun of Barack Obama for being a community organizer. There's some you know, connection between community and communism. So we weren't sure maybe the politicization of that, of that word uh, would, would throw things off. Um, but we did find a, a very slight effect that you know, conservatives were very, very slightly more likely to identify with their uh, community. Um, they were more likely than, than liberals to identify with their country. And again, the strongest effect we saw was liberals being more likely to identify with all humanity, right? So for here, we can see for conservatives, uh, they're really identifying with people in their community and their country more than all humanity. Whereas you see the opposite trend for liberals, right? Liberals are actually reporting more of this identification with all humanity than with people in their community or people in their country. And that could seem a little crazy at first, but again, I think part of what we're seeing here is this kind of um, prejudice aversion, right? If you're answering all these questions and you see the three targets all together, it's very clear, okay, well, I don't want to say that I identify with people in my country more than, more than all people because I know that that's, that's racist, that's nationalist, right? That's, that's prejudice. And so I think we're seeing some of that prejudice aversion here. Um, so these are kind of, you know, these kind of social categories, it's, it's a little bit obvious. It's not that surprising, the liberal and conservative differences we've seen. So we also had a couple of studies where we tried to see, okay, how basic are these differences? Um, and so we, instead of having social categories, we just had dots. And this is a task where participants were given two, um, two squares that had some moving dots in them, moving uh, sets of dots. And they were just supposed to really quickly, over and over, say which one they liked better. Which, you know, what, what's your perceptual preference, which one looks better to you. And we vary these in a number of different ways. So here you can see we're varying um, by shape, so the a triangle versus a, a circle. We also vary them by color. Sometimes they were multicolored. Sometimes they were all uniform. Um, and the one we were really interested in was we varied them by, by sort of tightness. And so either the, so in this, in this condition here, you see the circle, the dots are pretty tight together, and they're all moving together in a very sort of um, you know, unified kind of way. 
Um, in the loose conditions, the dots were, were farther away from each other, and they were moving a little bit more independently. Right? So there would be an overall movement, but each, each dot sort of had a little bit of you know, it, individuality. Right? So each dot was moving a little bit more independently. And we found in this study um, that conservatives actually had more of a preference for the sort of tight uh, circles um, than, uh, than uh, c conservatives have more of a preference for those tight circles than liberals did. Right? So this is association. Liberals like the sort of loosey-goosey structures where, where the, the different individuals were moving around a little bit. And what was really interesting is that we had a lot of people who did both this measure and either the love of humanity scale or the identification with all humanity. Um, and this basic perceptual preference actually predicted those kind of social tightness measures, um, even when we controlled for things like ideology, gender, education, and age. And so we're seeing some connection there with just a basic sort of perceptual preference uh, going along with the sort of, you know, do, do you prefer kind of tight social circles or more loose social circles? Uh, so when we looked at humans versus non-humans, we wanted to get a little bit closer to this idea of a moral circle. And so we created a measure where we actually just gave people this kind of, you know, dartboard here, and we explained the idea of the moral circle. And so we gave them, a, a, you know, 16 concentric circles, and we labeled them. And we said, okay, here's what these circles represent. Uh, you know, one is all your immediate family, then all your extended family, all your closest friends, all your friends, all your acquaintances, all people you've ever met, all the people in your country, all the people on your continent, all people on all continents, all mammals, all amphibians, reptiles, mammals, fish, and birds, all animals on Earth, including paramecia and amoeba, all animals in the universe, including alien life forms, and then all living things in the universe, including plants and trees, all natural things in the universe, including uh, rocks, and then all things in existence. Right? And so we're, we're trying to go as far out as we possibly can and give them a little bit of granularity to really specify these different groups. And we asked participants in, in a number of studies to indicate their moral circle. And we did this in a number of ways. In one study, we said, OK, we're going to give you 100 units of moral concern. And you can spread them across these different circles however you want. And we tried to clarify in the instructions, you know, if you're spending moral concern at level four, don't assume that that's covering levels one, two, and three. You need to spend it actually on those levels. I'm not sure how much participants actually listen to us there, as you'll see in the results. Um, and so when we're giving people 100 moral units to spend, obviously we're kind of forcing moral concern to be a zero sum here, right? Because if you're spending you know, a bunch in the, in the lower circles, you just have less to spend on the outer circles. So, so here we're kind of forcing it to be zero sum. Um, we did replicate this where we didn't specify an amount. So they could, they could spend between zero and infinity moral units at every possible level. And we saw the same differences come out in that kind of study, too, when we didn't force it to be zero sum. So in this study, first I'll just show you uh, in a sort of visual representation um, what liberal and conservative moral spending looks like across the moral circle. And so we see both groups are, are, are spending their units of moral concern ac across these different circles. It's not the case that conservatives are only caring about their family and, and not anybody else. But with the heat maps, you can see for the conservatives, there is more of this kind of concentration around the lower levels, right? around the levels of, of family and nation. Whereas for liberals, they're much more likely, again, to sort of fling out their moral circles as far as possible. Right? So liberals are more likely to be including space rocks in, in their moral circle. Right? Again, so, you know, I, I don't want to draw the line. I don't want to exclude anyone or anything. Um, and so again, it, and it's, again, it's not the case that liberals are not spending anything on their family, um, but you see a lot more of this sort of intuition that no, bigger moral circle is better. Uh, another way of looking at this data, about half of our rungs were human targets, and half of them were non-human targets. So if we just split up the data that way, um, you can see that for the conservatives, they're really preferencing the human targets over the non-human targets. Right? So they're, they're spending about uh, five times as much of their moral concern units on humans than on non-humans. And that difference just gets smaller and smaller as you move left on the political spectrum. And then for the extreme liberals, it actually goes away. Right? And here again, I think it's pretty surprising that the extreme liberals would be spending as much on non-human targets as on human targets. I, I think they, they might have had some kind of misunderstanding that, well, if I'm, if I'm spending it on space rocks, maybe that just covers everything, including the humans. But still here, the, the, the important thing is just that you're getting less of that preferencing. right? So, you know, less of a sort of hierarchy between human and non-human. 
Okay, um, so I want to connect this to some of my earlier work uh, on moral foundations uh, that Daryl mentioned. Um, these are, are different sort of basic sort of intuitive sensitivities to patterns in the social world. And when we were starting out working on this, um, we started in the most obvious way we could think of, where we kind of wanted participants to define the moral domain for us. And so we just asked participants, when you make a moral decision, to what extent are the following considerations relevant to your thinking? Right? And so here participants are actually rating how morally relevant different kinds of considerations are. And we had items related um, first to care, so things like whether or not someone cared for someone weak or vulnerable, as you can see, very relevant to people across the political spectrum. Right? There's a lot of agreement. Um, everybody thinks that, that this is very relevant. You see uh, this kind of slight downward trend where liberals are rating these as slightly more uh, morally relevant than conservatives are. Same story with fairness questions. Right? So whether or not some people were treated differently from others, very relevant to everyone, slightly more so to liberals than to conservatives. Then we also looked at these more sort of group-focused concerns, like loyalty. Loyalty to the family, loyalty to your nation, loyalty to just any kind of group. Um, and so whether or not someone showed a lack of loyalty, people are rating this as less morally relevant overall. And we see that conservatives are actually rating it as more relevant uh, than liberals are. For questions like authority, so intuition, you know, concerns of respect for authority, respect for tradition, respect for hierarchies, um, these kinds of things, again, rated uh, more relevant by conservatives than by liberals. And finally, we have questions related to physical and spiritual purity, like whether or not someone did something disgusting. Um, and there's a lot of disagreement here. Some people think that's quite morally relevant. Some people think it's not very relevant at all. And so for all of these, you know, you can see that these are very linear trends for, for all of these different moral concerns, um, very sort of continuous across the ideological, ideological spectrum. Uh, so it's not just the case that people at the extremes are, are different and they're the ones that are arguing. Um, but if you look at the extremes, you can see how different they are, right? So if the extreme liberals over here, you know, care and fairness are up at the top of the response scale. It's between very and extremely relevant. Whereas loyalty and authority and purity are being rated at the, in the lower half of the response scale. Really, just not that relevant at all. So there's a huge distinction uh, for liberals. And that distinction, uh, you know, eventually sort of goes away. So the extreme conservatives, um, they're not making that distinction. All five of these kinds of moral concerns are, are sort of relatively equally relevant to conservatives. And so we wanted to replicate this in a, in a number of ways. First was just across measures. Um, and so this relevance task, I think, is very abstract. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of task that I think works really well for highly educated samples. When we've done it in nationally representative samples, it doesn't work quite as well. Um, and as social psychologists, we know that there's limits to introspection. And so if I'm trying to step outside myself and think, OK, how do I make moral decisions? I might just be wrong about that. right? Um, so we also just gave people more direct normative statements and had them agree or disagree with them. Like, it can never be right to kill a human being. Uh, we wanted to kind of hit people in the gut a little bit more. So we presented them with these awful taboo trade-off uh, items, like how much money would I have to pay you uh, to get you to kick a dog in the head really hard? right? So we're, here we're just proposing different violations of these foundations. And here we're interested not only in how much money they're requiring to violate the foundation, but how often they picked the, the sort of top uh, response choice, which was, I would never do that for any amount of money. Right? That's some indication that this is something that's sacred to them. They wouldn't violate it for any amount of money. Uh, and then finally, getting outside the lab, um, looked at uh, sermons from liberal and conservative churches. So these were Unitarian Universalist versus Southern Baptist churches. Um, and we looked at. Uh, the kinds of, of moral words that were being used in those sermons and how those words were being used. And in all these different methods, we, we saw the same basic pattern of results. Conservatives uh, were more concerned than liberals uh, when it came to loyalty, authority, and purity. And liberals were more concerned than conservatives when it came to care and fairness. Um, and so we also you know, wanted to replicate this across samples. So we started with students in the lab, then moved to these kind of academic websites. If you're interested in morality, you can go to your morals. Um, to take a whole bunch of different morality surveys and experiments. If you're interested in, in uh, implicit prejudice, you can go to Project Implicit. Uh, of course, we did MTurk studies because we're legally required to as psychologists. Um, and then we also have replicated this in a few nationally representative uh, samples as well. Um, and also, I think this is kind of important that the, these kind of patterns have been replicated across research labs. So a lot of different researchers using a wide variety of measures and, and for, for a wide variety of reasons, have replicated these basic liberal-conservative differences. Uh, most recently, in, a, in a many labs, um, 
study where a whole bunch of different labs were testing this out at the same time. And then finally, we wanted to try to replicate this across world areas. Uh, and so here we are curious about, you know, does this pattern that we've seen a bunch in a bunch of uh, U.S. samples, uh, is this something that's just about liberals and conservatives in the U.S.? Certainly the words liberal and conservative mean different things in different countries, right? In a lot of countries, the conservative party is actually pretty left-wing. Um, John Jost and others have found that the terms left and right actually translate pretty well across cultural contexts. Um, and so when we were collecting this data, we, we included a kind of description of what we mean by liberal and conservative. We mean, you know, left-wing versus right-wing um, to try to explain that to people. And so this pattern here, it kind of looks like a greater than sign. We're just interested to see, do we see that in other parts of the world? Um, so we see the same basic pattern uh, in the UK. We see it in Canada. We see it in Australia and New Zealand. We see it in Western Europe, Eastern Europe. We see it in Africa, in Latin America. We see it in the Middle East. South Asia, East Asia, and Southeast Asia. So in all these different parts of the world, we see this same basic pattern, right? Increasing differentiation between care and fairness and the other three foundations as you move left uh, uh, on the political spectrum. But there's a huge caveat. Uh, with this data, all this data was collected at, at your morals. Uh, again, a, a website started by a, a bunch of Western moral psychologists. Uh, some of them are answering the questions in Spanish, but most are answering the questions in English. And so these are people that have heard of this website somehow and are answering questions in English. So it's probably a very uh, sort of westernized or, or weird um, subpopulation of those countries. Uh, so over the last several years, I've been working with researchers in other countries to translate a lot of our materials. Um, now they've been translated to more than 40 different languages. Um, and most of these translations have been done by research teams in those countries who are, who are collecting data in those countries, sometimes online, sometimes not online. Um, and I've also been involved in some field work in Nicaragua, India, and the Middle East, trying to reach uh, populations that we wouldn't be able to reach with a website, basically. Um, okay, so a few slides ago, when I was describing these, these differences, I said to you, as, as I usually do in talks, uh, you know, for the extreme conservatives, um, all five of these moral concerns are approximately equally relevant, right? Conservatives are valuing these five different things approximately equally. Uh, recently, I was talking with the moral psychologist Celia Moore, and she sort of took me to task for this. She said, well, OK, maybe in the abstract, if you're answering a really abstract questionnaire like this, then you can say, oh, I value loyalty and fairness the same. right? I'm, I'm marking the same relevance for both of them. She said, but when, in the actual world, what does it mean to value fairness and loyalty the same? Because these two are, are, are so often coming into direct conflict with each other, you can't just in the abstract say, oh, I value both. Right? There's so many instances where you have to make a choice, especially with something like loyalty versus fairness. And I think she's absolutely right. And I think that's a, a way to sort of connect some of this work with some of the moral circles work. Right? So, so I think these fairness concerns are, are, are very clearly sort of centrifugal forces. Right? Concerns about fairness, equality, egalitarianism. Those are urging us to sort of expand our, our moral circles outward. I think loyalty is very clearly a centripetal force, right? Loyalty is a sort of intuition or the notion that, you know, we owe things to our family that we don't owe to others, um, that we're supposed to be more morally concerned with the people close to us than people that we've never met. I think authority and purity in, in less direct ways kind of lend themselves to this kind of centripetal force as well. Um, there's a lot of sort of purity in, in just putting up a border, putting up a line between these are the people I care about and those are the others. Um, you know, if, if you're really concerned with uh, respect for tradition. A lot of traditions have hierarchies involved in them and have this kind of preferencing for in-group over out-group as well. Um, care I put here in the middle, I, I kind of think about care sort of uh, like the debates about emotional empathy, where I think care is very much um, based in the attachment system. I think it's sort of, it is, has a kind of parochial nature at least at first, but I'm still very open to the idea that maybe that kind of uh, affective connection can be used to then maybe in some ways be a centripetal force as well. But I think the important thing here with both the moral circle work um, and the moral foundations work is that these aren't just things that you know, liberals and conservatives are disagreeing about. It's not that you know, here's, these people care about this one thing and these people care about this other thing. Um, I think it's really important that everybody cares about all of these things and these are, these are uh, conflicts that we feel within ourselves too. Um, so just to end with, before we uh, get into questions, 
Uh, I'll just end with a descriptive point, um, which is that opposing forces in the moral circle are not just intergroup or interpersonal conflicts, but intrapersonal, right? Trying to decide where to put our moral circle. Should we be making sort of a hierarchy? Should we be preferencing our, our very close others over other people? I think these are struggles that we, that we all have, and these are struggles that we're having within ourselves, not just between, say, liberals and conservatives. Um, so with that, I'll say thank you and uh, open it up to questions. One, two, okay. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you for the talk. Thank you for coming, it was fun uh, and interesting. Uh, just with respect to the centripetal v centrifugal question and sort of moral e efficacy of expanding that circle, um, when, we're, when we think about liberal in the United States, obviously, you, you were talking about this, like it's, it's a sort of hazy word sometimes. Um, specifically sort of the, the left wing of liberalism in the United States, sort of being defined by something that's a little bit contradictory, um, sort of on the one hand, uh, the, the Sanders movement with not me, us, fight for somebody you don't know being expansionistic, being paired with something like Pete Seeger's Which Side Are You On?, which is necessarily divisive. Um, now, if, if you're on that end, like me, I, I would say that that's toward a purpose, but as a moral psychologist who's like looked at this data, would you say that uh, commitments to selection can have a role in that expanding of the moral circle, or do we have to regard them with a large amount of suspicion and distrust? So what do you mean by commitments to selection? Commitments to selection basically being uh, an identification of what stands in the way of moral progress. Um, class conflict being a big example of this. Yeah, so, and, and I think you can see that in a lot of left-wing ideologies, certainly. So, you know, you might have very particular left-wing ideologies where, you know, the, the man is what we got to take down, right, that are very sort of op oppositional. Um, or this very kind of, you know, generic kumbaya, all humanity is my in-group kind of, kind of notion. Um, so I think that you're right, you know, different sort of liberal subgroups, you might see this differently. I mean, I think, I think you'll still see this kind of consistent difference on, you know, where should the moral circle be? I, I think there are sort of normative disagreements about that. Um, there was one, one study that we did. I, I thought it was a brilliant idea because it was my idea, and it totally didn't work. But we had a study where we asked people to, in, in sort of in counterbalanced order, to indicate you know, where their moral circle is in, in a number of ways. And then in another condition, um, asked them um, to indicate where they think it should be. And my idea was that liberals would sort of feel guilty that their moral circles weren't bigger, but that conservatives might actually feel the opposite, right? That they would they would feel guilty that their circles weren't smaller. Like, oh, my moral circle is, you know, I'm including a lot of people, but I really should be focused on the family, and, I, and I'm just not. So I, I felt like maybe people felt like they were not living up to the ideal moral circle, but that that ideal would be in opposite directions. Uh, it turns out it didn't matter at all. If you ask people, where should your moral circle be, it's it's where they say their moral circle is. So I didn't actually see any difference there. But I, I think there might be some notion there that, you know, this is, this is where it, it should be. matter of care, um, uh, the vegetarian ethic is one example that gets very sticky because many, many groups have uh, dietary uh, limitations that uh, uh, may impel them not to uh, uh, communi commu communicate and have food with the, the, uh, an opposite group necessarily. And so there are th uh, there are various uh, con concentric uh, possibilities for examination in this realm, I think. Um, and I, it, it, I think the vegetarian and vegan um, network is, is an example of the difference between the uh, liberal and conservative, that the more radical 
the vegan people are, uh, the more they do have their own culture and their own particular social um, uh, circles. That's interesting. Yeah, I, and that, that would be a great kind of subgroup to look at. Um, there's there's some work by uh, Daniel Crimston who's who's also looked at the moral circle. So so we're kind of a, imposing an order. You know, like we we think that immediate family is closer in than friends. Some people have written to us to say, oh, I feel my friends are way closer to me than my family. I don't you know I don't communicate with my family or something like that. So I think there are yeah. ways that maybe yeah. these concentric and, circles would be and in different I think, orders. I think for some some uh, circles, cultural circles even, the aspects of the grace or some acknowledgement of a higher authority at a meal is, is a particular uh, marker for conservative um, uh, morals, I think. Like saying a prayer before, yeah. before yeah. dinner, yeah. And for, for the vegans, are you thinking that they would, they would see their own sort of in-group as, as primarily vegan? There's a, a big identity there, Definitely. and that meat eaters are that's that's the farther out people. Even if they're in your community, in your nation. Yeah, my daughter. Yeah. Has her own circle as both a vegan and a raw vegan. Yeah. Morality. I think it'd be great to do you know even more sort of like open-ended or, or qualitative work, trying to look at at what people's own conceptualizations of their moral circles. Because I think you would get a lot more um, kind of idiosyncratic examples like that. Like here's the thing that's really important to me. Right, I'm a I'm a Star Wars fan. Those are my people. Everybody else is outside. You know, whatever it is, right? Um, and and yeah, because we're just kind of imposing a very kind of generic, you know, social distance sort of chart. Um, so I know in Dan Crimson's work, he's done interesting things. Like he has people place different entities on the moral circle. And he has things like terrorists or enemies. You know, he has, he has some kind of social sort of categories that that we're not capturing. Yeah, that you Grandin, yeah. Yeah. There's certainly plenty of people that, that say I feel more connection with, with you know cats or dogs than I do with other people. So yeah, that'd be great to look at. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, is this on? Okay, so I really enjoyed it. So um, and I, I I appreciated the last thing that you were talking about that these opposing forces are in, in, inter, intrapersonal sort of thing. So I was wondering if you've you know, looked at how that manifests. And I guess um, it's leading me. I, I've noticed in studying and looking at you know, what is inspiring to people on the left versus the right in terms of media messages, there are like a host of messages that I think are popular on the right that are like basically police officers being nice, often to African American kids. Right, and I'm, and and that seems exactly in line with what you were saying. It's like they're trying to resolve this particular conflict between what is perceived as not, not caring but adherence to authority, yes. and and so I'm wondering, you know, how you see that. Other ways you might see that manifest, and whether or not we actually are aware of it. Do we experience it, cognitive dissonance, or is it just something that is in the background but it doesn't? It's not distressing to us to have these um, moral conflicting. Yeah. Well, it's kind of interesting because, you know, when the um, Black Lives Matter movement started, you know, something like two days later, the All Lives Matter, you know, that, that was the sort of phrase that came in to be a sort of contradiction to that. And so you would think, oh, you know, part of that argument seems to be, well, you're only focused on black lives. I think that all lives matter. And that's what's really, you know, and the people who are saying black, we're saying, no, we're saying that. Black lives matter too. Like we're saying that you know these these lives are not being given sort of consideration. So it does it doesn't make sense to say all lives matter. Like yeah, we know that, but we are talking about this particular problem, right? So so I mean that may be one case where the sort of I don't know the the messaging or something is is um, you know trying to be done in a, in a kind of tricky way. Um, but I certainly see you know in, in a lot of the the police stories, I think there's a lot of you know author, you know respect for tradition, respect for authority. Um, there's a lot of you know kind of like fashion photos of the, you know, the, the helpful police officer helping people out. So um, I think that's part of what's playing out here, certainly in terms of like moral foundations, you know, looking at a, a conflict between, say, authority and something like fairness or, or just compassion for black people who are getting killed um, by police. Um, so you see a lot of those kinds of, you know, pe people 
sort of um, building their messaging on different kinds of moral foundations, depending on which side they're on. Um, thank you so much for your talk. It's like prompted a lot of ideas. And cool. so um, um, I'm a qualitative scholar in the business department, so um, I'm not a moral psychologist. So I'm hoping you will <laughs> forgive me. Um, uh, and uh, an organization theorist, so it's been a while since I did OB. Uh, but I do emotions. If I give you my blessing, you'll automatically be in the angry <laughs> 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 um, But I, I, I did take OB twice, so, you know transfer student. Um, so my question is, um, I, I research uh, algorithms, and so um, and those, that's a non-human entity, right? And so they're not space rocks, but they are something you interact with interpersonally and have in, intrapersonal emotions about. So where would Absolutely. they fall in to the moral circles, right? Because I'm dealing with a lot of humans who have a lot of emotions, Uber drivers, Amazon, uh, entrepreneurs who have a lot of emotions about the algorithms Absolutely. in their lives. Yeah. And, there, and so I, I'm curious. <laughs> yeah, there is some work um, being done. Actually, my, my collaborator Adam Waits has, has done some work in this um, area. It, it's really fascinating. We've talked about, like, you know, Google, where does Google go in terms of those social distance? If you ask my kids to draw out their moral circles, I think it would go something like mom, Alexa, dad. <laughs> right? I mean, they, they, you know, they rely on Alexa. They, they play music with her all the time, but they also know that there are certain questions that that are not mom and dad questions, or like, how much does the earth weigh? Like, if I get annoyed in my kids, I'm like, you know that's an Alexa question. Go ask Alexa right now, you know. So they, and they, you know, they, I'm sure they feel some kind of connection to this, you know, what's basically an algorithm, you know. Um, so it is, it is kind of fascinating just to see people's connections to, you know, technology, to non-human entities, as they're becoming more and more human-like. Um, it, it doesn't really matter if, if they are feeling or not, right? Is is that we treat them as if they're feeling? Um, I had something where when we first had an Alexa, she I, I made a terrible joke and and immediately regretted it. So Alexa got something wrong, and I as a joke said Alexa apologize, and then she did. And she said I'm sorry, Jesse, and my kid was there, and then I saw him asking Alexa to apologize. I was like, oh my god, I'm teaching my child like misogyny or like but you know being mean to the help kind of I was just like horrified and it was you know and I felt bad for this non-human entity I was like oh my god I've been like now I'm like teaching my kid to mistreat this non-human entity yeah. I guess yeah Siri yeah they're all female voices yeah Jesse, thank you so much. Um, I'm, I guess I'm a pretend moral psychologist. Um, I wanted to ask if you, if you could talk a little bit about um, the interaction that you see about, uh, with different moral theories. I mean, um, when we think about um, ethical ideologies, um, levels of relativistic thinking, I can kind of see a connection with, with some of the moral foundation patterns with kind of, you know, Growing out of relativistic thinking, or certain certain groups kind of yeah. featuring relativistic thinking, what what do you do? You see any connections between you know some some moral reasoning theories that we've drawn upon for years and years um, with you know post conventional reasoning and, and and relativistic thinking, idealistic thinking. I mean, what do yeah. you see in terms of some interactions with with other moral theories? Yeah, it's really interesting. So one of the first. Um Scales that we put up in your morals. We started your morals back in 2007, and one of the first scales we put up um, was the EPQ, which has a sort of you know relativism, idealism kind of subscales. Um, so if you're in us, we, we actually probably have thousands and thousands of people who have taken those, and you can look at relationships with moral foundations. Um, so that's interesting. Also, a lot of the moral foundations work was um, based on other theory. We we're kind of trying to take you know theories from anthropology and sociology and kind of put them together with evolutionary theory, and so a lot of it is really based on. Um, Rick Schwader's work on, on different ethics, um, and Schwader's somebody who's written a lot about this kind of relativism, um, and he you know he's been accused of relativism in, in a lot of different ways, and it's one of those things where I don't know when when I give talks I try to be really um, cautious, maybe overly cautious to say all this is descriptive work because I think one of the hard things about the word moral is that it's so often used in a normative way, and so a lot of um, a lot of our, our critics have said how you know how dare you say that respect for authority is moral. 
I think it's immoral. You know, like, that's what Nazis do, right? Uh, and, and, I, and I would say, yes, yes, of course. I'm not saying that this is, all this stuff is necessarily morally good. I mean, I, I tend to take a pretty dark view of human morality. Um, I, think, I think human morality is, is really interesting, and I like to study it. But I just think because, because something, say, pushes our moral buttons, I don't think it's necessarily morally good, right? And so I think um, there's cases even, even where concerns like care and fairness, I think, can, can lead to sort of uh, negative outcomes. And so I'm not sure if that makes me a moral relativist about the moral foundations, but I, I think, you know, I, I certainly don't think all of these moral foundations are good and we should have all of them all the time, right? I think these are used in very sort of negative ways. So for instance, I you know, had a project where I was looking at white supremacist groups and the, the sort of moral narratives that they were building on, and it was really, it was like loyalty and purity are just completely unrestrained, take over all other moral concerns, and the only thing that matters is maintaining the purity of, of the white in-group. Um, and so, you know, care concerns go out the window, fairness concerns go out the window. If you look at, you know, like the writings of Timothy McVeigh and people like that, it's really like this is the one moral goal. It's the purity of the white race, and everything else goes by the wayside. But I think they're still building it on these kind of moral intuitions that people will have. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, uh, adopting kind of a Lewin, Lewinian perspective of a person in a situation, um, are there situational factors that exaggerate the pattern you showed or minimize the different, maximize the differences between liberals and conservatives or minimize? Yeah, so um, I'm trying to think of situations that would just maximize the difference. I, I certainly think there's huge situational effects. Um, so Tage Rye and, and Alan Fisk have uh, a really nice theory where they look at different <laughs> social contexts. And, and they really say, you know, all these moral concerns are going to play out differently if it's, say, a boss and an employee versus two family members. You know, so, you, you know, with an acquaintance, you might keep track of who owes who what. But if it's your spouse, you know, that, that might seem silly or that might, you know. So they, they have a lot of stuff of, you know, these different kinds of, like, relational sort of modes. Um, I think that's one way that the moral foundations can really vary by context. Is it really depends on what the sort of social context is. And, a lot of this, you know, if we're using measures like the Moral Foundations Questionnaire, like that relevance measure, that's very abstract, and we're not really giving a lot of the social context there. Um, so, and so, but and there's other measures where there's a little bit more of a kind of rich description of a social context, and you try to get people's, you know, moral moral judgments about that. I was curious about a few things. Uh, one, the heat maps, would they look different 40 years ago than they do now? Uh, the other thing is I was, um, I was wondering if the, if the circles were, they're, they're very equidistant from each other, right? So is, would there be any sort of change in reaction to where people may measure um, how they place e emphasis if if those circles were irregularly shaped or uh, not equidistant from each other, yeah. may that sort of prime people to think differently about their relationships with other entities? That's, that's a cool idea. Yeah, that, that would be a nice study, too. Is if It's not just, here's these concentric circles, put the entities where they go, but actually have people draw the circles. So, you know, you might have, you know, family and friends relatively close together, and then you know, once you go from all humans to all mammals, maybe that's farther apart, right? So you can get some sense of, okay, what is the actual social distance of these different sort of concepts? Right, and I'm a, yeah. I'm a health policy researcher, and so okay. we, we use ecological framework a lot, mm -hmm. and so that is, that is um, illustrated very differently to show sort of these gaps between sort of more interpersonal oh, okay. conditions versus exogenous factors. But yeah, so even if somebody's saying, well, this is still in my moral circle, but... It's, it's farther it's out. Away. It's farther away. Yeah. That's interesting. So maybe the two, if, if, you, would, um, uh, if you had a, a longitud longitudinal study, mm -hmm. you could see what one, one person at one person said at one age and how it began to change as the circumstances changed. Mm -hmm. so it would be very hard. Yeah, and, and looking at how these change over the lifespan, I think is yeah. a fascinating question. So there's a few, um, 
longitudinal studies have been going for a couple years now that have included moral foundations measures. Um, one is run by Dan McAdams, and he's looking at sort of adolescence through the 20s and 30s. That's been going for maybe five years now. And another is by uh, Chris Sibley, who is starting with, I think, like five and six-year-olds. Um, and that's been going for a few years. But those will be, you know, it will take a while to collect the data, but I'm really interested to see. Because they've got a nice panel where they're really, you know, keeping track of the same people and trying to track them for, you know, decades. Yeah, you. Just to see how these things change over time. Yeah, also, uh, now the... Yeah, and there, there is starting to be more work kind of done in collaboration between social and developmental psychologists on looking at longitudinal changes over these different kinds of moral concerns. Yeah. Um, there's, there's been a few where they've included things like Kohlbergian measures, with the, you know, post-conventional, those kinds of things. But yeah. I, I have a question about the, um, uh, about the moral circles idea. First, it, it resonates with kind of uh, Smith's circles of sympathy, I think it is. Um, so I hear some of that. Yeah. I'm wondering if you can disaggregate at all um, the difference between the entities that you're asking about and how distant they are. So, like, I'm imagining um, the the few f maybe friends or family members that I have that are conservative. They may never um, be connected or see a moral connection to a rock. Um, but maybe in the case if if it became their rock, right, their pet rock. So I'm wondering, like, if the entity, like, what the entity is, matters for whether um, these groups could ever extend moral concern to them. Like, are they, are they seen as agents that are due moral concern, whether or not the distance is close or near? Yeah. Does that make sense? That's really interesting. Yeah, so in, in the 1970s, when everybody had a pet rock, maybe that's, you know, the, the farthest the moral circle could have. But that's kind of related to the question about, you know, Alexa and, and AI, things like that. You're like, if you're, if you're sort of personalizing it to some extent. Um, I think certainly with, with animal, you know, there's a lot of sort of studies looking at people's attachment to animals being related to neoteny or, or cuteness, you know. So when, it, when an animal looks really cute, you know, that pulls on our heartstrings, that really pulls our sort of empathy. And it's very easy for us to make that sort of empathetic leap to a really cute animal. Um, and, you know, part of Singer's idea is, well, we shouldn't only be helping animals that look cute to us, right? That's also kind of parochial. But, but yeah, I think it's, it's really fascinating to look at, you know, both the entities and the, the distance to them. Thank you. Um, thanks again. So my question is, um, liberal conservative, that's one way we like make sense or describe how we view the world. What about other scales like belief in a higher power or wealth? Like, do you think we'd see similar results? Yeah, so, well, I've got a little bit on this. So yeah, I mean, um, I've been talking about ideology as just a single spectrum, right? And there's, there's obviously a lot of other sort of approaches. What, one of the things we did, let me see if I have some of this here. Yeah, so you could also look at this, right, by like religious versus secular. Um, so we did some work trying to look at different kinds of dimensions, you know, looking at, at ideology or, or looking at sort of morality in a two-dimensional way instead of a single dimension. Um, so this is a study from, from a long time ago. But we basically did a cluster analysis in the Moral Foundations questionnaire. So instead of like factor analysis where you see which um, items in a scale cluster together, this is actually looking at which people who take the scale cluster together, like here's a, th this group of people all take the scale in the same kind of way. Um, and this got us thinking about things that don't really neatly fall onto a, a single liberal conservative spectrum. Um, and so in this study, um, we gave the Moral Foundations questionnaire to a bunch of people. And the first two clusters that sort of came out, back then we were calling these harm, fairness, in-group authority and purity, but it's the same, same ones I talked about before. The first was basically secular liberals, again, care a lot about care and fairness, not so much about loyalty, authority, and purity. And then another one is basically just social conservatives, you know, relatively the same on, on all of these. Um, but then the other two clusters that came out, I think, don't really fall neatly on the spectrum. And, and one of them was libertarians. And so libertari self-reported libertarians are on the low end of the distribution for all five foundations. So when it comes to care and fairness, they look like conservatives. <clears throat> but when it comes to loyalty, authority, and purity, uh, they, they look like liberals. Um, another cluster that came out 
was mostly self-reported liberals, but they were also the most religious group. So we, we just called them the religious left. But they were on the high end of the distribution for all of these. And so this kind of got us thinking about libertarians because you know, there's been so much work on liberals and conservatives. And, and for, for whatever reason, our website got popular on a bunch of libertarian sites. And I think um, you know, a, a few people you know, blogged about it or something. So we had a ton of libertarians coming to the site. And so um, let me see if I have anything on Yeah, so, so this paper here that was uh, led by my postdoc, Ravi Iyer, was kind of one, one of the first big studies of just the moral psychology of, of libertarians. And so again, they're, they're scoring relatively low um, on all five uh, foundations. Um, if you ask them you know, the, the trolley problem, they're more likely than both liberals and conservatives to say, yeah, throw the guy off the bridge. You know, sacrifice the one person to save five people. Uh, they're also highly individualist. Um, they're, they're, um, they're very uh, sort of like, they're, they're, they're all about rationality, right? So like the libertarian magazine is called Reason. You know? and so, so part of it is you know, we had all these morality scales you know, empathy, psychopathy scales. And so they, they kind of looked extreme on all these groups. And we're thinking, is this just a group that doesn't have moral concerns? Um, and then we thought, well, what are they always talking about? They're always talking about freedom. They're talking about autonomy, liberty, kind of, you know, leave me alone. Let me do what I want. Don't force me to wear seat belts, things like that. And so we, we did ask them some questions about liberty. And, and they're more concerned. You know, they think that's more morally important than any of this other stuff, you know, than any of this, you know, loyalty or, or purity. They don't care about any of that stuff. But liberty. In fairness, they really care about. So that was that was one group that kind of falls off that single continuum that we looked at. Yeah. Hey Jesse. Hey. Um, so I guess I'm a little curious about how some of these, like you know, the moral concern and the the reach of it. Um, part of what I'm interested in is also like how people may selectively like kind of reach out there, like outrage or some of the things that really they want to get riled up about. So what I'm curious to know your thoughts on is like how some of this may predict how much people get riled up of, you know, different actions across, you know, intergroup boundaries, but also whether, you know, these two things might be orthogonal, whereas moral concern may be predicting these certain outcomes, maybe the way that people think about how they direct their outrage and how they want to blame other people may be a separate construct. I'm curious if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. I think there's a lot of really cool work being done on, on outrage. You know, I would see any of these kinds of moral concerns as potential sources of outrage, right? So if you, I, you know, this is the kind of thing you might use, you know, if you wanted to get different groups riled up in different ways, you might want to push different of these sort of moral buttons, right? Like if you know it's a conservative group, you know, really hit the purity and, and that'll, that'll get them more riled up than a, than a liberal group maybe, um, if, if, that's, if that's the goal, right? Um, and so I've, I've thought about, you know, how can these sort of, you know, ideological differences and moral concerns, how could that be used to try to calm down some of the, some of the outrage? Um, we've done some stuff, you know, and there's, there's stuff by Feinberg and Willer using moral foundations to, to frame arguments in different ways. That's basically sort of used as a kind of persuasion tool. So, and, and it has worked pretty well. So they had a study, their first study, um, they framed environmental messages either in terms of care and harm, like we're hurting the planet, we're hurting all these poor animals, and that's how almost all environmental messages are framed. And then in another condition, uh, they framed it in terms of purity. So what we're doing is disgusting, we're despoiling the earth, we're supposed to be good stewards of, of the earth, you know, as the Bible tells us. And so they really tried to hit the purity thing. and. Um, not a pretty dramatic effect. So for liberals, liberals are at ceiling in, in terms of their support for vi environmental initiatives either way. So it had no effect on liberals. But for moderates and conservatives in the purity condition, it actually brought them almost up to liberal levels of support for environmental initiatives. And so there is some indication there that you know, if you are framing your message in terms of the moral values of, of the audience that you're, that you're trying to reach, you might be able to, to more effectively communicate across these sort of ideological lines. Um, but I haven't done anything yet that's like, Here's how this is going to solve, you know, hyperpartisanship or, you know, online outrage. Certainly. Yeah. So, uh, kind of on a related note, where do we put our political opponents in the moral circle? Because I can think yeah. back to some of Mina Sakara's work about how much Schadenfreude goes on along partisan lines, and some work on animalistic and mechanistic dehumanization along partisan lines. Yeah. Are they even within this, even the potential circles, or are they just completely outside? Yeah, that's a great question, and, and we haven't looked at that, but I think that's exactly, you know, so I mentioned Dan Crimson had had enemies as a, just a general category. 
somebody might imagine an, a sort of you know political enemy or political opponent. I think they they usually thinking about you know Russians or some, you know some group that were uh, at war with. Um, but yeah, I think it would be great to look at that, and that might be the kind of thing that you know over time you know it, it seems like before people. Um, there were ideological disagreements, but people didn't have such strong opinions about Democrats versus Republicans. Um, but you see, you know, over time, people are now more upset with the idea of their son or daughter bringing home somebody from the opposite political party than they are of, of them bringing home somebody from a different race or somebody from a different country or somebody from a different religion. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that, you know, you might, like if we had good measures of this over time, you might see the opposite, you know, your ideological opponent moving farther and farther out. Them outside of not just people in my country, but you know I'm gonna I'm gonna preference the people who agree with me first, and then put them uh, sort of outside that. Um, I think it'd be great to look at, but we but we haven't actually included that in any of our measures. Yeah. Have you, have you accounted for? Um, can you account for when moral values change? I'm specifically thinking of things like liberals being very, very anti-war, but now will thank veterans for their service. So they've separated out the individual from the group think. Yeah. And how do you account for that in more values? Yeah, and so, so th you know, again, this is the kind of question that you, you might want to look at in a sort of longitudinal way, like when, when people's values just change over, over the course of lifespan. Um, we've looked a little bit, you know, Project Implicit was running um, during 9-11, and so they actually looked at some values changes just after, you know, a major sort of shock like that. Um, and so, you know, one of the things you see is that it was a very liberal sample, very anti-George W. Bush, then 9-11 happened, and then people sort of, like, moved to the middle, like, oh, he's okay. And then after a few months, they kind of <laughs> guided back. You know, but there, there was some sense of, like, oh, here's this shock. Um, we should sort of rally around our leader right now, and, and even like extreme liberals were were not so negative. And so, so we have some data on you know kind of responses to shocks like that. Um, but I think it's really interesting to look at you know how people's values change you know as they go through adolescence, when they go to college, and then you know uh, there is a general leftward shift when people go to college in, in general. There tends to be a, a sort of general rightward shift after they finish college and go out into the workforce. Um, so it'd be interesting to look at you know how values are changing in, in that process. Well, how do the values change after you've been, you uh, are not in a permissive situation in a work uh, situation? But after, if you were uh, working in an environment for 20 years, obviously, um, you know that certain things are just not valued <laughs> in an uh, environment. And so, if you wish to continue. Um, your career or, or a job, you are going to um, uh, certainly hew to certain uh, values, moral values, and, as well as just behavioral values. Yeah. So, do you have any any kind of data, data on that? I don't think so, but it was really interesting to look at that. It's sort of like lifespan, almost like values conformity. Like, if you're in a certain environment, are you just over time going to kind of drift? toward the values that the people around you share. Um, and it is interesting to look at you know, that in, in terms of you know, different workplaces. Um, there's a lot of stuff on like values fit between employees and, and, and the employers. Um, yeah. And that might be something that, that kind of changes over time. In the 1950s, there was a man with a gray panel suit. And uh, the, the uh, sociological uh, uh, right. Values of the of the working man, yeah, yeah, that would be, and it, it, it would be it would be great to look at too. I mean, you know, so I've been in academia for a long time. I think I, you know, like a lot of people, kind of self-selected academia and knew it was a very liberal. You know, I was pretty liberal when I came into academia. I always wonder if you know, I feel like I'm probably more like stridently liberal now than I was when I was an adolescent. And you could say, well, is that because I've been in a, basically in an academic environment since I was an adolescent? Am I sort of conforming to my sort of normative, you know, group pressures, or is it like I would like to think that I'm principled and I, as I learn more facts, I learn more, you know, liberalness or something, you know, like that's that's what I would like to believe. But there, there's very likely, you know,
know, I'm in a very sort of ideological polarized environment, and it, it's likely that I've had some sort of like conform, you know, slow drift conformity over the past you know couple of decades. So yeah, so I was thinking about like you mentioned like how as people um, get into college and they become more liberal. So I was thinking about the rela the relationship between knowledge and empathy. So I, because I was thinking like to be able to empathize out group, like you need to have certain amount of knowledge about that group to be able to actually consider the benefit of that group. So I'm thinking like uh, like in light of the difference you found between the liberal and conservative, do you think it is um, um, an outcome due to, you know, like the level of knowledge they have about outgroups, or it's more of the result of their, um, like, moral socialization, or like, I mean, like, how how much do you think like the education they receive and the knowledge they have is playing a role? Yeah, yeah. There's a, a lot of evidence in um, political psychology of things that make you more conservative, and it's, you know, different threats. So, you know, a, a major threat like 9-11 makes people more conservative. People tend to get more conservative as they get older. One of the few things that I've seen that sort of consistently seems to, you know, make people more liberal or, or move people in a leftward direction is, is foreign travel. And so traveling to different places um, is something. And again, it's, uh, this hasn't been done that often in an experimental way where you randomly assign some people to do, you know, travel abroad and some people not to do it. Um, and so it could be a self-selection kind of thing, but it seems like w after people have traveled, they tend to be, you know, higher in openness to experience, but also uh, more liberal in, in various different kind of political opinions. Um, and so that could be part of it. I mean, that's what I'm really interested in with the sort of emotional empathy too. Is if you know, if you read really rich descriptive descriptive stories about people in other parts of the world, is that you know the, the kinds that like really pull on your heartstrings? Is that something that can sort of help you effectively connect to people who are, are farther away, um, and, you know, without even having to travel to those, to those places. So, you know, watching a really good movie, um, or a really good foreign movie, where it's a group of people that you never thought about, you know, social structure you're not familiar with, but by the end of the movie, you feel like you really have a connection to some of the individuals there. So, I'll get, I'll get your question. I just, just so I, I've got my, my legs have gotten work out. But I, I have a question. I just want to jump in. Um, so I, I liked your what, the way you integrated empathy in the moral circles. And I was just curious. I mean, some of the folks, the anti-empathy folks like Paul Bloom, mm -hmm. they build strong distinctions in their conceptual arguments or ethical arguments about empathy and compassion having different motivational. Uh, the, the potency of the force is different. And so, like Bloom, for example, suggests that the compassion is something you can cultivate for all beings in a much more rational, kind of detached way that doesn't have some, perhaps some of the same uh, centrifugal tugs. And so I'm just curious so, if- So he's against emotional empathy, but he's, he's all for compassion. Right, and so I'm just curious if, if, if when you're thinking about the centripetal, centri centrifugal forces, you're drawing a strong distinction between like empathy and compassion, or you see them as kind of of a piece with each other. Yeah, I guess I, I kind of associate them. I mean, you know, we, we always think of compassion as being part of the sort of care, you know, that, that we're kind of looking at. And so that's why I kind of hedged and put care in the middle there, because I'm just not sure where that goes. And that, 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 you know, just if that's moral concern in general, um, you know, all of our writing about care is sort of that it is based in the family attachment system and, you know, mother-child kind of bonds. Um, but again, I think that's the kind of thing that I think, I think could, be, could be spread out there. Um, but I'm not really so. So even when I talk about like the moral foundation of care, I'm not really specifying. Oh, this is cognitive, you know, rational compassion, and this the, and this part of it is is emotional empathy. We're we're kind of glomming all that together in care, I think. So yeah, so it might be good to sort of distinguish those. Yeah. I want to go back to that comment you made about watching other people and feeling for them, because in uh, I I study disabilities. And something that's come up again and again is this idea of inspiration porn and how this yeah. is increasing inequities between society. You know, so if we're using empathy as this, just I'm feeling bad that I can care for others and there's not this reciprocity and they can care for me. And I'm just wondering how that fits in. I know it's not a normative morality framework, but I'm curious so how that fits in. It's a way for me to pat myself on the back that I'm caring right, for right. These, these lower creatures or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we, we were talking before the talk about um, emotions like elevate, these kind of other praising emotions like inspiration and elevation. And so many of the videos that we use to inspire elevation would be like a disabled kid who's who can't run the race, but his dad carries him on his back. I mean, there's so many videos like that, and they are so moving. Um, but yeah, it's it's a completely one-sided. You know, it's like, oh, aren't you a good person for feeling bad for this disabled kid? There's very little agency for that disabled kid. You know, it's if you think about you know the morality of sort of like agents versus patients. You know, like the ones that are doing versus the ones that are sort of done to. Um, you know, the disabled kid is, is very much this sort of like moral patient, right? So, um, so yeah, I think that's a very kind of one-sided. Um, I mean, I, maybe that's part of why it's like inspiration porn is that it's sort of like you're just trying to feed that sort of like, oh, I want to feel good, and I want to feel good about myself and feel like a good person, but you're just completely like, almost like a morally objectifying, you know, what you're actually watching there. Yeah. Any other questions for Jesse? Okay. Well, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, I just want to thank David Price.